Okay, good morning year 11s. I'm gonna go through with you right now with a mini lesson on how I would like you to plan for and prepare an essay responding to the first three acts of Macbeth. So if you're looking at the screen, I'm first gonna show you how to find this assignment. So I created it tonight. So if you go to the posts, you've got quite a few assignments to work through. Um, the first three assignments were created by Ms. Mullins. So you've got summaries to complete for each act. Now, if you've been doing this in class um, or you've been following my YouTube videos that I've put up online of me reading through the play, then you'll remember that I've been instructing you how to write the summaries at the start of each act or scene. And so that should be very easy for you to do if you've been keeping up to date. And so. I would suggest that you do that as homework and spend today's lesson on what I'm gonna show you. And that is the latest act, um, I mean, assignment. Don't worry about the character's assignment right now. I might, I'm on the fence of whether I'll put that up as optional, but I would like you to focus on this. So the act three essay. So if you go into view assignment once you're in Teams, I'll show you what you can see when you're in the student view. So this is my view, just ignore that. When we're in this, the student view, you'll be able to see your instructions. So it says to use this ed essay planner here, as well as your own resources. So this is completely open book. If you wanna use any of your annotations in your play, if you wanna use your booklet or your summaries or anything else that you've been taking notes on, you absolutely can. And I want you to use that to write a text response essay. And as you can see here, I have uploaded a rubric. So I'll just press on that to show you. So this is um, based off the rubric that I've given you in class. So as you can see, you're being assessed in th four areas. This is the same rubric that we will use for your SAC. We're still awaiting on more information from BCAA on how exactly that should be run, but we should still be preparing for it as though we're going ahead as usual. So as you can see here, we're looking at your text context knowledge. So that's your understanding about the times and the period in which this text was written and who it was written for and who it was written by and all of that. We're looking for your actual understanding of the text. So if you've still not read this, you've got no excuse. It doesn't matter if your computer's shut down or anything because you don't need a computer to read this. It's all here. And if you're struggling with the Shakespearean language, then absolutely just read the English side. You have no excuse not to have a rudimentary knowledge of this story. So please read that if you haven't already. You absolutely must. No putting it off if you wanna do well. Okay, the next thing that you're look we're looking at is your ability to follow analytical essay structures. And then lastly, your accuracy of written language. So keep that in mind whilst you're writing this practice essay. You wanna be achieving all four of these areas every time you write an essay. Okay, now the next thing is you will want to open up um, your reference material. Now, um, you could go straight to download it, but I'll just show you what to do. So, um, oh well, it won't let me open it up here. Basically, you just wanna open it in Word onto your desktop. Yes, I uploaded this. I'm pretty sure I didn't put a virus in it. Taking some time. And there it goes. And this is what it should look like. It says Macbeth, Macbeth Extended Text Response Planner. Um, it explains all of that. And then here are just three topics for the end of Act 3. So I've tried to make that very clear. You should be able to write all three of these essays once you finish the end of Act 3. Um, so if you haven't read the whole play, there's still no excuse as long as you've read up to the end of Act 3, you should be able to do this task. So there they are. I'm going to actually close that now and I'm going to show you one that I've prepared earlier. So I've actually prepared one for this lesson that has some of this stuff in it. So here's mine. Um, so basically your first step once you're in this planner is to pick one of these essay topics. So you'd want to read through all three of these and once you've read through all three and you've picked the one that you want, you want to highlight that and you'll want to copy it. 
because then we'll go down to the next step, which is to break down the essay topic or question, whatever you want to call it. And it says to type your essay topic in here. And so that's where I will paste it. And as you can see, I've picked the one that says, are the visions that appear throughout Macbeth supernatural or merely the manifestations of having eaten the insane root that takes the reason prisoner? And that last section is a quote. And as you can see there, that's from Act 1, Scene 3, lines 85 to 86. And so that's helpful if I want to go back and look at that section of the play. And so once I've got that essay topic, I can go through these six steps of breaking down the question. So I've done my first step already, and so now I want to go to the second step. And that says, define or look up any unfamiliar language or unfamiliar events and characters from the text. So I'll read through that again, and if there are any words or any references to characters or events that I do not understand, I want to write that in, section, in box two. So basically, there used to be instructions here. Oh well, I think it's still pretty easy to follow. Um, so basically in box two, I want to write down definitions for anything that I find unclear. So if I don't know what the word merely means, I would write the word mere, and then I would write a definition for it. So here I'll just look up the, um, the synonyms, and I'll say uh, it means like simply. So simply. And uh, so on and so forth. So if there's anything else I didn't understand, um, I might look up the quote and I might say that the quote is said by Banquo after seeing the witches, etc. And I'll just write down anything there that I need to be made clear. Step three is to underline any important words or phrases in the topic. So now I want to read through it and anything that I think is an important word or phrase I want to underline. So I think the visions are important. Uh, I think the word supernatural is important. And I think the phrase merely the manifestations is important. Um, you might have more or less depending on your own preference, but it's basically anything you think is so important that you're going to be writing about it throughout your essay. So um, as you know, every topic and linking sentence, so every T and L sentence in a text response essay links back to this essay topic. So you'll be using these words quite a lot throughout your essay. So that is why you will need synonyms. And that is the next step, is to find at least three synonyms for each of these words. So the first word we've got here is visions. So let's look up some synonyms for visions. We've got apparitions, hallucinations, and visualizations. Let's do that. So then I'll write my three synonyms. Apparitions. That is apparently not how you spell apparitions. How do you spell apparitions? Apparitions. Ooh. Apparitions, hallucinations, and visualizations. And that'll sound. There we go. Um, the second word I want to find three synonyms for is supernatural. So I'll write that down. Again, I'm just going to use word to help me with my synonyms. So I'm going to pick paranormal, mystic, and mystical. Paranormal, mystic, and mystical. And of course, if you're wanting to expand your synonyms a bit further, you absolutely can go into thesaurus online, or if you have a thesaurus at home, you could use that. And then the third one is merely or manifestations. And I'm going to go a bit further here. I know that that quote is an example for insanity. So they, are they an, um, an instance of insanity? Are they a manifestation of a broken mind? So I'm going to actually look for synonyms for insanity, which I know is a bit of a jump, but hopefully you're following me here. So we're going to say senselessness, craziness, and irrationality. Senselessness, irrationality. What was the third one I said? Senselessness, irrationality, and craziness. 
Okay, so let's look back up at our instructions. We've done step one, we've typed out our essay topic, we've defined anything that's unfamiliar, we've underlined important words, and we've written out synonyms for everything we've underlined. Now we're up to step four, and step four says, rewrite the essay topic in your own words, making sure to simplify it. So here's step four, and this is a box where I can write my essay topic. So how could I write this in my own words? Well, first thing is, with a question like this, it's open to interpretation. There are different ways in which I could respond to this. I could say that, in fact, all of the visions are supernatural. Or I could say the supernatural elements have nothing to do with the visions and they're all part of Macbeth's ailing mind. They're not really there. So I could toss a coin and choose that, or I might already have an idea. Um, and in this case, I already have an idea. And I actually want to go with the first option. I want to say or argue that Macbeth isn't going crazy organically, but in fact, these visions are real and he can see them. So that's how I'm going to rewrite my question. I'm going to say, what are three examples that the visions throughout Macbeth are not the result of him going insane due to guilt, but are instead supernatural creations of the witches. All right, so that is how I want to respond. So what are three examples that the visions throughout Macbeth are not the result of him going insane due to guilt, but are instead supernatural creations of the witches? My next step, step five, is now to brainstorm ideas. So now I want to think throughout the whole play, or in this case, the first three acts, if you've read a little bit further, then you could even go into those acts if you want to. Nothing's stopping you. I want to think of three or more examples of this. So the first could be um, the floating dagger. Uh, and the fact it was covered in blood. Uh, my second example, my second idea is something to do with Banquo's ghost and um, my third idea could also and these are more examples of them being uh, supernatural I could also say uh, that the floating dagger leads to Duncan's death and that in turn leads to the prophecy being fulfilled Banquo's ghost leads Macbeth to go back to the witches. I could also say here Macbeth says he is happy that Banquo is dead just before this. He says to the murderer that he's quite happy that Banquo is dead. Um, the only thing that's making him stress is the fact Cleance is still alive. So that's an argument against Banquo being just a manifestation of him going mad or his guilt. It's leaning more toward the fact that the witches are conjuring this vision. And then the third thing I'm thinking of is right at the beginning of the play, we've got all these examples from um, Thane, the Thane of Ross, Ross as he's referred to in the play, and the Bloody Soldier or captain as he's referred to, that Macbeth is bloodthirsty. He's out for blood. He's this vicious soldier who cuts through anyone and doesn't care. So why would he be guilty about two mo more murders on his plate, murdering Duncan and Banquo? So we could say Macbeth is bloodthirsty. And you could go more and more into this, especially the more you've read Later on in the play, you could look at the fact that 
when Macbeth does go back to meet the witches and he meets them uh, in a can or a cabin uh, somewhere where there's a big cauldron in the middle, they also manifest, they create visions of Banquo and Banquo's heirs. And so you could use that as further evidence to them con conjuring Banquo's ghost at the banquet in Act 3. Uh, and so on and so forth. So you could continue brainstorming, but you could also stop once you have three because three is the minimum you need to go on to step six. And step six says, once you've finished brainstorming, select your three best ideas and then collect one to three quotes from the text for each idea. And I'll show you where to do that. So underneath this, breaking apart the question is a area to collect evidence and so I'm going to just write down my three ideas here we've got the dagger leads to the prophecy being fulfilled so that's my argument for the witches creating it or why they would want to create it then we've got Banquo's ghost and what did we want to say about that that leads Macbeth to go back to the witches. And if anyone's read that um, tiny scene at the end of Act 3, the one that people think Shakespeare didn't write, that they think it was from a different play because there was a song attached to it, then you would know that in the very next scene, after Banquo's ghost finally goes and Macbeth talks to Lady Macbeth about going back to the witches, we find out that that's exactly what Hecate wants. So Hecate is the goddess who's in charge of the witches and she says to, she tells them off for interfering with Macbeth. That was never part of her plan and she never told them that they were allowed to do that and she said that Macbeth wasn't a worthy person to be giving prophecies to. And she says that they are going to have to give him illusions and tricks to play with his mind and lead him into confusion so that he meets his end, so that he dies. So that is another great example of why Banquo's ghost might have been created by the witches in order to lead Macbeth back to them. And then lastly, my third idea is that um, the witches, they state explicitly, they plan to use visions to confuse Macbeth and lead him to his death. All right, so those are my three ideas. And as you can see, I've already pre-collected quotes as evidence. And as you can see, I have not limited, limited it to one quote per idea. You really want a minimum of three quotes per idea. And sometimes those quotes might mean that they're made of lots of little quotes. So as you can see, this could all be used as one sentence of evidence, but it's actually made of three different quotes. So, is this a dagger? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. And I could sprinkle those quotes all in the one sentence, and it would really only count as one quote altogether. Uh, and so you can see there I've got many per idea. So we're just going to break down uh, how to use the rest of this planner. So as you can see, it's not a full template, though there is one available for you. I'll just quickly show you where that is. So um, I've shown you where to get this in assessment, but if for some reason the assignment isn't working tomorrow, instead you can go into files, which is where I'm gonna send you to get this lesson. And if you go into Act 3 Essay, under here you can see there is also an essay template. So that's resource number three. And if you open that, you'll see there's a template that you can use uh, that gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to write a full evidence. And you can see here, this is using two quotes per paragraph. Though, of course, it's ideal if you can go up to three per paragraph. So what that would look like is you would have evidence analysis, evidence analysis, and then before linking, you would do a third evidence, so a third quote, and a third analysis. So they would end up being quite long. But that's all about just succinct writing and good wording. Okay, so introduction. So here it is optional whilst you're planning that you could write a full introduction. 
Uh, we'll go over introductions in more detail later on. Just for the plan, you could write your contention. So just a reminder how to write a contention. You reread your question. You might even read the question that you rewrote. And then you answer it in your own words in one sentence. So my answer to this is that the visions that Macbeth sees throughout the play are not manifestations of his own mind, but are in fact created supernaturally by the witches. And that's what I would write there as for my contention. Okay, and then just a quick rundown for my topic sentence, or not my topic sentence, for my opener, so my first se sentence of my introduction. Um, I can give you a document. We are going to adapt a PowerPoint for you to go over this in more depth, but I like to start the first sentence of my introduction talking about setting. So I would say something like, set against the backdrop of Feudal Scotland, William Shakespeare's Macbeth, and because we are typing this, I will italicize that, is an exploration of murder and the supernatural. Okay, so we there's a basic structure there. You say set against the backdrop of the setting. You introduce the text, who wrote it and what it's called. And then you state something about the themes it explores, the characters it, explo it explores, the main ideas, so on and so forth. And that's just a basic structure of an opening sentence. And that's generally how we'll structure an introduction is opener and then contention. And then the third sentence is your summary of your three main ideas, or to phrase it better, your introduction of your three main ideas. So that's when you would go back to your three main ideas, or th say three examples of this are, and then you would summarize one, two, and three. And I'm not gonna do that right now because I think you all know how to do that. But in the end, this introduction would be standardly three sentences long. But I'm gonna go over to my plan out for paragraph one. And as you can see here, I've written three words, uh, author plus for, verb plus idea. And this is the basic structure of a topic sentence. Okay, so the first step is easy enough. Author. Who is the author? William Shakespeare. Ideally, you would have already introduced his full name, William Shakespeare, in your introduction. And so you don't need to use the name William again. And you can refer to him by just his surname. So the first word of my topic sentence will be Shakespeare. Shakespeare. There it is. And then following that directly, I want to use a strong verb. Now, most of the time, the verb that you use in your topic sentence is going to be a synonym for the word shows. Okay. But you don't want to just use the word shows because it's not a strong verb. It's boring. It's boring because it's overused in essays. And so instead, you're going to want to use your thesaurus skills or your own vocabulary or look up perhaps topic sentences online to find strong combinations of words. Or you could just use what you've got here on Word and you can look up synonyms. Okay, so I've got demonstrations, displays, expressions, illustrations, appearances. Not all of those are working, but illustrations. I don't want it to be a noun like that. I want it to be illustrate. So I want it to be a verb in the present tense like that. So Shakespeare illustrate. If I don't love illustrates, I can always go back into synonyms. I could say exemplifies. That's cool. Like I haven't seen that used much. There was another one there that said elucidate. That's a really nice one. I don't see elucidates very much. Uh, you could say characterizes if you're focusing on a character. Typifies if you will look typifies is a very specific one. So if we think about the word typical, so Shakespeare makes 
something very typical or points to something very typical, typical you might use the word typifies. I'm just going to keep exemplifies here. I think that's really nice. And then we want to link to our main idea. Um, so we could say Shakespeare exemplifies the, the power, the supernatural beings have over Macbeth when the floating dagger first appears. Okay, so that is author, verb, and then my first main idea. So my first main idea was the idea that the dagger leads to the prophecy of Macbeth being the king hereafter to come true. And so I've written that out in this structure. Your second step, if you're planning it like this, I'm just gonna make my introduction a bit smaller because I can see here I'm gonna run out of room. So my second step is to put in my examples. So to put in the quotes that I've collected. And I've just realized I'm probably gonna need another quote for this one. And that is the quote um, that he shall be king hereafter. And that's from Act 1. Of course, if you don't remember these quotes from the top of your head, you should be recording your quotes in the front of your booklet at this point. Uh, and so you can always go there. Or you should be highlighting your quotes as you read through and making annotations. If you haven't done this, I believe that Miss Mullen has photocopied all of her annotations and they may be available online as well for you to look at. But for now, please do your own work. Make sure you're recording your quotes in your booklet and that you're highlighting and annotating your book as you read through it. And then the last step would be for you to fill in an analysis or an ex of, under your explanation. So remember that your analysis has to tie in your the, your knowledge of the author, so your knowledge of Shakespeare and what he was trying to show his audience. And if you're doing this well, it should also link to the context the play was written in. So your explanation should also mention perhaps King James, it should uh, mention the Elizabethan era, it should mention what Shakespeare was trying to appeal to. So if you remember back to some of our lessons about King James, You'll remember that we discussed how he was a full believer in witchcraft and the supernatural. So indeed, this idea of Shakespeare, the, this idea of Shakespeare's that the witches were powerful and they did have power and influence over Macbeth would have definitely been appealing to King James. And that's something you could talk about in your explanation. So you could say here that Shakespeare intended or intends, I believe we're meant to continue with present tense in an essay even though the writer has passed. Shakespeare intends for, I'm going to do intended right now, just because this is a draft and it doesn't read right. Shakespeare intended for the super, uh, the witches, let's say weird witches just to change it up. I think that's meant to be capitalized as well as a proper noun. For the weird sisters to be seen as maybe to be seen to have power over Macbeth. The appearance of the dagger is an example of this as it led Macbeth to kill Duncan, thus fulfilling the prophecy that he would be king hereafter. And you can do things like this, you can squeeze quotes into your analysis sentences. You don't have to always isolate quotes to evidence sentences. You can sprinkle them throughout any part of your paragraph where they work. 
Okay, and now I need to put in the second part of my explanation, which is the context part. So who is this for? Why? Why did they why did Shakespeare make the Weird Sisters powerful? Why did he hint at them having this level of influence? So um, depicting the witches as having this level of influence would have directly appealed to King James's infamous belief in witchcraft. And you could go on and on and on, but I have run out of room for there. And so there I've got my plan for paragraph one. And I'll just make everything fit in however I can. Okay. Then I would go on to do paragraph two. I'd do the exact same thing. I would follow author verb idea, but this time instead of using idea one, I would use idea two. I would copy and paste my evidence into there and then I would write out my explanation ensuring, I don't think I have it here, ensuring that I meet the requirements that I'm aiming for in my rubric. So every time I'm planning out my explanation, if I'm aiming for, let's say, a high, I want to make sure that I am showing my understanding of the text. So I am using, uh, I'm using a logical interpretation of the meaning. I'm looking at a broad range of features, so I'm making sure that I'm not repeating myself. And I'm also mentioning the world of the text and how its values are expressed by Shakespeare. And I want to also analyze how Shakespeare is responding to his audience and purpose. Okay, so I want to make sure that is in my explanation. So I'd repeat that with paragraphs two and three, and then I'd be on to conclusion. So how to write a conclusion. Your first step is to do the same thing that you would do for your contention, but this time I want you to consider everything that you've written throughout your plan or throughout your essay. So it should have a very different feel to it than your contention. Whilst your contention would be short and sweet, so remember that's the second sentence we've written here, uh, and it really sets up and introduces your essay and doesn't give away too much information too early because there's a lot to say, your conclusion should start with a very wrapping up, very finalizing kind of feel. So. A nice way I like to start my conclusion is with the word considering. Considering, or you could even start with the word by. Like by considering all these examples. So we're pretending that we've written the plan or the essay at this point. So by considering all these examples, it should be clear that the visions Macbeth saw were not a symptom of a failing mind, but were more so that I think were more so this is a point that not that you feared, but were more so the the opposite of a symptom, the cause. What's a better word for cause? Instigation. Uh, the very, very thing that instigated his confusion as was ten intended by the weird Sisters. Okay, so as you can see, it's a lot more long. It's a lot longer. It has um, more words like considering. All these words that are linking back to what I would have written in my essay, and that's step one. 
step two also reflects your introduction quite closely, and that is to re-summarize your three main points. Of course, again, just like this first sentence, it's going to be a little different from your introduction because you would have written a lot more, there would be a lot more in your head, things would be clearer. So your second sentence should uh, summarize idea one, two, and three. So you could say this could be seen in the way the dagger and Banquo's ghost appearing to Macbeth worked in the witch's favour, as well as Hecate's explicit instructions to confuse him with artificial visions at the end of act three. All right, and then I could leave it there. That could be my conclusion and that's fine. If you wanna do one more sentence, the third sentence of your conclusion should be a link to the bigger picture. So in this case, ask yourself, what was Shakespeare's intended purpose? And frame that in the, within the lens of your essay question. So my essay question here is particularly focused on the weird sisters and the witches and their supernatural power. And so I would want to link that to what was Shakespeare's purpose? So I'd ask myself, why did Shakespeare show the witches having very real, real power and not only regular power, but power over a king and the ability to manipulate a, a king and lead to many bad things happening and the natural order of things being reversed. Um, I could answer that by saying, well, he was pandering to his own king's belief. So his own king, King James, had been newly instated to the throne and it was important that Shakespeare and his company gained approval from him, not only so they could continue performing their plays and writing them, but so that they could be funded by the crown. So there are many reasons Shakespeare wanted to pander to King James's beliefs, even if they weren't necessarily his own. They could have been, they might not have been. Um, and that would be the bigger picture purpose that I would link to in this final sentence. So one way I could say that is that uh, through this play, Shakespeare intended to reflect his own king's beliefs in the power which is held over mortal men, spreading a message on the dangers I don't like the word dangers, the perils of which craft. All right, and that would be how I would wrap up this conclusion. So as you can see, both the conclusion and the introduction should be around three sentences long. And when you write out your full paragraph, if you were using, for instance, three quotes, it wouldn't be four sentences long, like T-E-A-L, um, the, th the three quotes and the three analysis would make six sentences and then your topic and the linking sentence would put that up to eight. So it would be T, topic sentence, evidence analysis, evidence analysis, evidence analysis, and then link. So eight sentences. Um, of course, if you forget that, you can always download the template from the files in your Teams and use that and fill that in before writing out your essay. However, when you do go out to write your full essay, I'll make a suggestion that you do it um, at the bottom of this, so with your planner. So once you've filled out your entire planner, and you could spread it out, you can go down and start a new page and just write your essay underneath. So you would say Act 3 Essay. You might rewrite your topic. 
and then you could start your introduction here. And once you finish that, you could save it and then you could upload it back in Teams and you could, and I would suggest that you would upload it into your assignments tab. And you might have to wait till after the school day to do that, just because I found today when many people were on assignments, they took a long time. So you would find the assignment that this is in referring to. So it's not a summary, it is wherever it is, it's the essay, Macbeth Act 3 essay. And then in your view, you would just submit it. I'm not sure where you would submit it, but you would submit it somewhere in here or email it to me if we can't figure out how to submit it. Yep, and once you've done that, I'll be able to grade it against the rubric. So we'll continue working on this tomorrow and good luck.